Good morning everyone. Welcome to another English video lecture. Now today as we discussed during our online session, we'll be focusing on Journey to the End of the Earth by Tashani Doshi. Now she's a young author actually, like she's just 45. She's still alive by the way and she still writes. She's still a published author. She's also a dancer, a choreographer and all the other things. Not a big fan of her, never really read anything about her. Like this is the first time after my school days that I'm reading her name because when I was in school, that's when I read this chapter. And I didn't pay much attention to it because it was pretty boring back then. Right now, like I'm paying attention to it and now it's just sad for me. Uh, because all these things that she's talking about, like to uh, happening to Antarctica, like the glaciers melting and the ice levels going down and this has already happened. Like we are living in an era where like global warming is at, uh, is at its highest, you know, every summer is a record breaking summer, every summer is the hottest summer it's ever been, you know, places like well, in Portland this summer in America, like the power lines were melting, it was so high, Pakistan had a temperature of 52 degrees which could like basically boil your internal organs inside your body. So, I mean, this is like kind of an outdated piece and this should be updated. That's the reason why I keep saying like the NCRD syllabus needs to be up updated every second year or every third year or even every year the syllabus should be updated. Because like what I'm teaching you right now, like I'm looking at this book, by the way. So if I'm looking to the side, I'm looking at the book and I'll be sharing like, uh, you know, screenshots and I'll be talking over them. I'm sorry, I haven't been able to upload proper long videos because like my camera isn't working. I don't know, there's something wrong with my memory card. I need to order a new one and Amazon is saying the new one will be delivered on Sunday. So hopefully by this Sunday, I'll have a new memory card and I, I can throw out this trash and actually record like proper long videos like I used to do for you guys. Uh, but I hope like the voiceover thing, it doesn't bother, to, uh, bother you too much, you know, because that's the easiest way for me to make like long videos since we all know like the school has made like a mandatory thing that I have to make like a video a certain length. Uh, so like since I can't record videos anymore because my SD card is just completely ruined and so that's the only way I can, I can do it, like uh, share a screenshot and do a voiceover over it. I know it might be a little bit boring. I know a lot of you haven't been watching the videos and I apologize for that, for like making it in that way. But I mean, you have to understand, like there are certain limitations that I am also dealing with. I don't have a lot of time as well. So anyway, so Tishani Doshi, not really, uh, can't really say anything much about that lady. I mean, this is a very well written piece though. Uh, but at the same time, like I said, like all these authors, all these modern Indian authors, like I was never really a fan of that and I was never really encouraged to read that. Uh, so I'll share with you like what I used to read, but like what why I was interested in this is got like a lot of nautical terms, it's got like a lot of ecological terms and everything else. So I thought maybe you guys would be interested. And having a conversation about global warming, climate change is never a bad thing. I mean, we reached a point like because when we were in school, we were taught like, you know, global warming, we should slow it down. Otherwise, in the next 10 years, this is going to happen. Well, it has been 10 years since I've been out of school here. And uh, yeah, the world has gone to crap completely. Like there is nothing left. Like the climate is gone, economy gone completely, like natural resources gone, oceans disappearing completely. Like they're warming up, things are dying, coral reefs are dying. The Great Barrier Reef, which I used to study when I was in school, is already dead in Australia. I mean, the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, the Enron oil spill, like, you know, the Arctic sea ice disappearing, no more polar bears, the Antarctic, like, you know, glaciers melting into the sea. So it's not a really very happy place to be right now in the world. There's a documentary by Leonardo DiCaprio on global warming and climate change, which you should watch. If there was a way for me to include it in this video, I would have, but I would get copyright strikes so hard by YouTube, like my entire channel would shut down. So I can't really do that. So the thing is like, uh, get on the online class. All right, people like if you're watching this video, if you're here on this intro still, just please join the online class because we'll go through images. We'll go through a documentary. We'll go through some TED talks that I have regarding this topic, regarding climate change and regarding everything else that I want you guys to listen to. So the next online lesson we'll be doing like TED talks and I'll be showing you guys a few documentaries and some lectures or anything else, because I feel like I've been ignoring that side of your education for a bit. So uh, during the online lectures and everything else, I'll try to keep it uh, interesting. I'll try to, you know, provide you with more information. For this video, I'll just go through the explanation, all right? I'll explain the entire chapter with screenshots like I've been doing. And I'll give you guys like a PDF with the summary and like the themes and all that. This is not a very complicated chapter. Like there are some technical terms here and there, but the theme is very straightforward. It's just like a lady's travel journal. She's just telling us like what uh, she went on this trip. She went on this program called Students on Ice. 
she wasn't really a student but she still went on it because she was eligible for it and then this is her experiences you know dealing with everything else dealing with antarctica dealing with like the journey and what she saw there so not a very complicated chap- uh, chapter there's no twists there's no turns uh, the only complicated language is the uh, you know technical terms that she's used and a few vocabulary words here and there uh so as always make a note of all the difficult words try to find the meanings in dictionaries try to underline them and then try to write them down and everything else you know i've already taught you all the skills you need to know okay as now it's up to you because we've been doing this for a while now but once again if you want me to go through some techniques again some study techniques some understanding techniques that i explained to you before now you don't remember so just let me know and like i know i'm being stuck a lot lately like what i've been talking and i think it's just because of my brain like i'm just frazzled uh, frazzled is another word you can look up but yeah my brain doesn't work anymore is because there's only a limited amount of brain power you have children and like i've been trying to like squeeze every drop out of my brain and i need a goddamn break so So uh, I'll be starting <laughs> I'll be starting a GoFundMe for my vacation to the Maldives and once I get my money from GoFundMe I'll be going to the Maldives I won't be going to Antarctica I'm not journeying to the end of the earth uh, screw that I'll go to a tropical island I'll drink mojitos I'll have like a coconut on the beach whatever it is yeah I need a vacation people I know I just went off track this video but I just need a vacation Anyways, let's just get into the chapter. I'll be uh, sharing a few more resources in this video. Some nice, really nice videos. Some drone footage of Antarctica and some really nice time lapse footage and everything else. So make sure you watch the entire video. I hope you guys aren't getting bored with the voiceover thing. So if you are, just wait till Sunday. Sunday I'll get my new memory card and I can do the voiceovers. I can stop doing the voiceovers. I can finally make like the entire videos. Anyways, uh, this is like just about enough. This is where my SD card is about to cut off. So let's just get into the video and I hope you guys have fun. So now let's take a look at the chapter together. So first of all, I would like to say this is like a travel log or a travel diary or a travel journal. So it's written in the first person perspective. So basically the narrator or the author is directly telling us what she's saying or what is happening or what her thoughts are. We're reading her comments, we're reading her ideas based on the situations that she is facing because she's used the word I throughout the entire chapter. So those of you who don't know this, pay attention. This is written in the first person perspective. <clears throat> Excuse me. just had to clear my throat so early this year i found myself about a russian research vessel the academic shokalsky all right that's how I, you can pronounce it i'm not really sure because i'm not russian i mean you can automatically tell i have a really terrible russian accent i can't do the russian accent properly other the academic shokalsky that's how my russian accent is uh, heading towards the coldest driest windiest continent in the world antarctica now just remember there's like two poles antarctic and arctic right so the arctic circle and then the antarctic circle that's what we used to refer to it as in the olden days i don't know what it's called now like i said things keep changing when we were studying it was the antarctic circle and the arctic circle uh so her journey begins at 1309 degrees north of the equator in madras now these are latitudes and longitudes now i don't know 1309 degrees north if that is long uh, latitude or longitude all right not a sailor not a navigation expert So you can look it up you can google it up 1309 degrees north of the equator you can actually google this thing and if you come on the online lecture we can do this together all right so her journey starts in madras now we don't call it madras anymore i think we call it chennai now all right so that's a, uh, you can tell like this is a very old piece you can automatically tell because nobody calls it madras anymore except for me and other people like me who grew up in like a time where it was bombay and it was madras and everything else but now everybody says mumbai chennai and involve crossing nine time zones six checkpoints three bodies of water and at least as many ecospheres once again going from madras to antarctica won't be an easy route uh, i think we can uh, take a look at it online when we join our lecture so we can take a look at like what the route this ship takes and we can actually go look at like the students on ice website when you guys are online so we can do this together so if you come online we can do like the students on ice website together Anyways, by the time she sets her foot on on the Antarctic continent, she had already been traveling for a hundred hours in a combination of car and aeroplane and a ship. So, getting to Antarctica not an easy thing. Like, uh, so there's seasonal routes and everything else because there's like a certain time of the year that you can go through. Otherwise, you cannot go there. And then, like, there are researchers that live there throughout the year and everything. 
So for regular people to go to Antarctica, it's quite a big deal. It's quite a huge, I mean, monumental endeavor. Like 100 hours of travel is not something that is easily done, you know. 72 hours is three days, so 100 hours is more than that. I get tired traveling from here to bloody Delhi and I can't even imagine like uh, changing from a car to an aeroplane to a ship and then getting to Antarctica and then living in Antarctica. Well, no, thank you. Please send me to, to a tropical island where I can have my Mai Thais, where I can have my mojitos and everything else. You know, no Antarctica for me. Anyways, uh, I hope you guys really don't get bored with these voiceovers. And if you are, just let me know, all right? Because from next week, I'll just make a video instead. Uh, but the reason I do these voiceovers is because it's much more easier for me to record these videos and it's much more easier for me to adhere to the length that the school has asked while I'm doing a voiceover than it is while recording a video. Anyways, okay, so we'll take a look at what she's written. So my first emotion on facing Antarctica's expansive white landscape and uninterrupted blue horizon was relief, followed up with an immediate and profound wonder. So all these words that I'm using and that you don't understand, you need to be looking up their definitions, you need to be looking up their meanings as well. Wonder at its immensity, its isolation, but mainly at how there could ever have been a time when India and Antarctica were part of the same landmass. Now, once this clip ends, I'll roll a clip which shows you how Gondwana land split into like India and all the other continents. So you can take a look at that as well. Like this, uh, in the next sentence, 650 million years ago, a giant amalgamated southern supercontinent Gondwana did indeed exist. All right, this is actual real ge geology. So like geologists know this, like this is what happened. Like there was a supercontinent that split up into everything else. So I'll just stop talking now and I'll share the video of Gondwana land breaking up and everything else. And then we can go back to the chapter. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed that little video and that shows you how all the continents separated and how like Antarctica was formed and everything else. So I'll just go through the chapter. 650 million years ago, a giant amalgamated southern supercontinent did indeed exist and its name was Gondwana. Uh, centered roughly around the present day Antarctica, things were quite different then. Humans hadn't arrived on the global scene and the climate was much warmer, hosting a huge variety of flora and fauna. For 500 million years, Gondwana thrived, but around the time when the dinosaurs were wiped out and the age of the mammals got underway, the landmass was forced to separate into countries shaping the globe as much as we know it today. Alright, so now this is another example of like uh, geological history of our planet. So the video I've shared uh, tells you how things moved around and then uh, we can take a look at like some other documentaries. There's a documentary called Cosmos, which was uh, done by Carl Sagan originally in the 80s, but then they made a remake with, uh, remake with Neil deGrasse Tyson recently. So I have a few episodes of Cosmos lying around with me. And uh, like I said, if you want, we can do like a watch party. We can do like a documentary watching session online. Uh, I don't know how happy the school will be with that. So I might need to ask permission. So I'll figure it out today. I'll send a message in the school groups as well. So we can watch a documentary on this entire thing as well. And actually, I would uh, rather say like watching a documentary on what this chapter is about would rather be much more interesting than just studying this chapter. Because like I said, this is outdated now. Like all the information that is being provided to you. A lot of it is outdated now, like carbon dating studies and everything else that have been done in Antarctica 
all the research they were probably doing like all the research that we talk about in this chapter has already probably been done because this is such an old old story right so that's the reason why i really don't feel like too much uh, you know uh, what can i say what do i not feel too much i don't feel too much of an interest regarding the story is because it's outdated i would rather teach you guys something new uh yeah instead of that like i would rather teach you guys like that documentary by leonardo dicaprio which is actually kind of interesting you know before the flood it's called uh, so if you haven't seen it you can look it up online before the flood by leonardo dicaprio i might be able to put in a trailer here if i mute it so to visit antarctica now is to be a part of that history to get a grasp of where we have come from and where we could possibly be heading is to understand the significance of Cordilleran folds and pre-Cambrian pre -Cambrian granite shields, ozone and carbon evolution and extinction. Now, all of these stuff, like all these terms that I hear, Cordilleran folds, pre-Cambrian granite shields, these are all geological terms, all right? Geologists use this. So you can look these up. You can look up the definitions and everything else. And once we are in the online lecture, we can discuss. So just look up the definitions. I don't think you really have to go into it, but Cambrian is like pre-Cambrian is like part of like, you know, uh, the timeline of Earth is divided into Cretaceous uh, periods, right? The Cretaceous period, the Jurassic period, the Precambrian period, the Mesozoic period, and this and that. So this is like one of those periods. Uh, I don't remember enough of my enough of my history, so that I can tell you like all the time periods from the top of my head. That's why I'm asking you guys to look this up. Anyways, uh, when you think about all that can happen in a million years, it can get pretty mind-boggling. Imagine India pushing northwards, jamming against Asia to buckle its crest and form the Himalayas. South America drifting off to join North America, opening up the Drake Passage to create a cold circumpolar current, keeping Antarctica frigid and desolate and at the bottom of the world. All right, now this entire chapter, like the movement of the continents has been explained to you in the video just that I've just provided to you guys. So you can look at that. And like, yeah, this is how the Himalayas formed, like, you know, the part of uh, India that floated up from the south and pushed up against Asia. And like, that's why the mountains are called Young Fold Mountains. That's why the seismic activity in this region is still unstable. That's why Uttarakhand is considered one of the prime regions to, you know, experience devastating earthquakes and everything else. So this is the reason why. And uh, this is what the author is also telling us, like, you know, how it's formed. And I've shown you the video as well. So I think this is clear. The final line for this page was, For a sun-worshipping South Indian like myself, two weeks in a place where 90% of the Earth's total ice volumes are stored is a chilling prospect. Not just for the circulatory and metabolic functions, but also for the imagination. Alright, once again, like she's from South India, so not a lot of cold in South India, as we all know. Like we are the North Indians, we are supposed to live in the cold. And then the people who live further up in the mountains, like, you know, in Ladakh and stuff like that, they're even hardcore than us, alright? So she's a South Indian, doesn't like the eyes, pretty understandable. Uh, chilling prospect, uh, look it up, what does that mean? Chilling prospect, not just for circulatory and metabolic functions, but for imagination as well. All right, makes sense because like the landscape in Antarctica, like if it's it's a frozen wasteland, basically, like, you know, there is nothing there. It's all frozen. It's like walking into a giant ping pong ball devoid of any human markers. Now I'll change the screen in a second. So this is the explanation for this page. I hope you guys understood it. And I'll add some more footage of Antarctica, like the time lapse footage and everything else after this. And so you can you can look at it like there's some drone footage that I'm including. It's pretty cool. So just take a look at it.
So I hope you guys enjoyed the video that I just put in. I loved it. I mean, it was incredible footage, but the problem is like, you can see it now, like even things are changing now. There's not a lot of ice left, you know, and the seas are warming up. There aren't a lot of animals left. So this is just like uh, last few glimpses of Antarctica before like in the next couple of decades, we lose it completely. But if you look at this page, like this is what the author is saying. The visual scale ranges from microscopic to the mighty, midges and mites to blue whales and icebergs as big as countries. The largest recorded was the size of Belgium. Days go on and on and on in surreal 24-hour austral summer light and ubiquitous silence, interrupted only by the occasional avalanche or carving ice sheet, consecrates the place. Now, these are all difficult words, so please, please look up the meaning of these. All right, austral, ubiquitous, occasional, I think everybody understood. Carving means something, consecrates means something. So look these up, look up the meanings of these words in your dictionaries. And then I'll share another video. There's a time lapse footage of the Aurora at night in Antarctica. And this is gorgeous. So just get through this. I know this might be boring, this explanation. But if you get through this, you get to look at a cool video. Okay. Uh, it's an immersion that will force you to place yourself in the context of the Earth's geological history. And for humans, the prognosis is good. Okay. So now we are moving on to what she says about human impact. Human civilizations have been around for a paltry 12,000 years, barely a few seconds on the geological clock. Now, that number is debatable, 12,000 years, all right, um, because people have found bones and everything else that are older than that. So, like, Homo sapiens as a species might be existing beyond before 12,000 years, uh, just in a very different form than what we know of now. So, that might be debatable. I'm not a historian or a geologist or a zoologist or an anthropologist. So... Uh, look this up, uh, try to verify it. But from what I have read and from what limited knowledge I have about the topic, I think 12,000 years is uh, not actually correct because I think they found that like we have skeletons going back even further. Okay, but um, on the geological clock, that's barely seconds. And that's true. Like the history of the earth, the earth is like a billion years old. And like in a billion years, like, you know, for like, for example, uh, if you compressed all of like the time from the Big Bang till now, uh, this was a graphic shown in like Cosmos. I'll try to get it into the video uh, as well. So basically, like if you compress down all of time from the Big Bang till now into a single calendar year, human beings will exist only on the last second of the last day of 31st of December. I'll put a video here if I could, if I can find it. And if it doesn't get me copyright striked, I'll put it into this video as well when Neil deGrasse Tyson explains it much better than I can. But yeah, human beings have been around for a very, very minuscule amount of time. If you look at it, like the entire history of time as well, like because the planets and everything else have been around here for billions and billions of years. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> in that short amount of time, we've managed to create quite a ruckus, etching our dominance over nature with our villages, towns, cities, megacities. The rapid increase of human population has left us battling with other species for limited resources and the unmitigated burning of fossil fuels has now created a blanket of carbon dioxide around the world, which is slowly but surely increasing the average global temperature. Once again, all of this stuff has already happened. We're dealing with the consequences right now, constant cyclones, constant typhoons, uh, pandemics, uh, insane summers, incredible winters, you know, people freezing, people sweating, people dying, you know, all of this stuff is already happening. 
climate change is one of the most hotly contested environmental debates of our time. It's not really a debate at this point. Like I said, it's just a fact and everybody who denies climate change is an idiot right now. Uh, will the West Antarctic ice sheet melt completely? Will the Gulf Stream Ocean current be disrupted? It has already been starting to melt and it has already been disrupted, the Gulf Stream current. Will it be the end of the world as we know it? Maybe, maybe not. Ah, of course it will be like the end of the world as end of human civilization as we know it. Earth will go on, humanity will end. That's what I believe anyways. Uh, either way, Antarctica is a crucial element in this debate, not just because it's the only place in the world which has never sustained a human population and therefore remains relatively pristine in this respect. But more importantly, because hold in its ice cores half million year old carbon records trapped in its layers of ice. If you want to study and examine the Earth's past, present and future, Antarctica is the place to go. Uh, Alright, so this is this page over. So what does it mean? Gulf Stream Ocean Current. Alright, so look up what does the Gulf Stream Ocean Current means. Uh, Gulf Stream Ocean Current is the reason why Europe is not a frozen wasteland anymore. So look that up and um, ice cores and all these half a million year old carbon records so basically what they do is like they drill straight down into the ice they pull out like these long tubes of ice and like recording because ice freezes in layers right so like since the ice is untouched for so many years you can actually reach out and see like what the atmospheric composition of the air at that time was by studying the ice bubbles and then you know the gases trapped inside the ice uh, i'll try to find a video of that that as well and add it to this uh, and uh, i think yeah so this page is done. I'll add a few more videos. So this is a little bit more interesting for you than just listening to like bloody voiceovers.
My name's Neralee Abram, I'm an ice core scientist and I work with the British Antarctic Survey. And the reason that I work on ice cores is that they're an amazing way of going back and looking at what the Earth's climate was like in the past. And that gives us information on how the Earth's climate is changing now and how it might change in the future. When you get to a field site in Antarctica, there's nothing there. The people who go to Antarctica and do these sorts of jobs are scientists, but once you get into the field, you're pretty much everything. So you need to build your camp, you become a carpenter, you become an electrical engineer, you're a cook. You have to be able to uh, be very self-sufficient to make the project a success. The drill works on a winch. So when we lower the drill down, we drill about a metre and a half of ice and then we bring that to the surface and we lower the drill back down again and drill the next metre and a half of ice. And we keep on repeating that process over and over again until we reach the bottom of the ice sheet. When we drill down through the ice sheet, we're drilling further and further back in time. We drilled an ice core that was 364 metres long and the ice that we recovered from the bottom of that ice core is over 20,000 years old. This is a part of Antarctica where climate is changing really quickly at the moment and the temperature has warmed by over two degrees in the last 50 years. We're seeing glaciers flowing faster than they have in the past, ice shelves are collapsing. When we cut open the ice we can see these bubbles of ancient atmosphere that have been trapped inside the ice ever since it formed over Antarctica and we can actually measure the composition of that ancient atmosphere and it's through measuring the greenhouse gases from the bubbles in ice cores that we get this clearest link between what the temperature of the earth has been like in the past and the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And that allows us to have a better understanding of how the climate is changing now and how it might continue to change in the future. So I hope that was educational and you understood now why studying ice cores is important and why preserving Antarctica and the Arctic Circle is important for scientists as well. And how fast global warming is happening, how quickly it is happening, how rapidly climate is changing. All right, so Students on Ice, the program I was working with on the Shokaski aims to do exactly this by taking high school students to the ends of the world and providing them with inspiring educational opportunities which will help them foster a new understanding and respect for our planet. It's been an operation for six years now, headed by Canadian Jeff Green, who got tired of carting celebrities and retired rich curiosity seekers who could only give back in a limited way. With students on ice, he offers the future generation of policymakers a life-changing experience at an age when they're ready to absorb, learn, and most importantly, act. All right, the reason the program has been so successful is because it's impossible to go anywhere near the South Pole and not be affected by it. It's easy to be blasé about polar ice caps melting while sitting in the comfort zone of our respective latitude and longitude. But when you can visibly see glaciers retreating, ice shelves collapse, and you begin to realize the threat of global warming is very real. <clears throat> 
now i'm not going to explain the rest of the chapter because like this video is already pretty long and i'm not sure if this is going to get copyright striked or not and then youtube might take it off so i'll spend the rest of my time trying to make sure this video is copyright proof because i want you guys to go through these uh clips that i've shared because they are very educational anyways but about this things like uh global warming is very real like i said this is very outdated everybody should know by now that global warming is real and in fact like there shouldn't have been a debate in the first place so the reason why the global warming debates and everything happened is because of capitalism companies were going to lose money there was going to be a carbon tax implemented and everything else so that's why they lobbied against it that's why they created like this massive multi-million dollar misinformation campaign against global warming against climate change which i have videos on as well so i'll share that with you guys during the online lectures but for now i think this is enough this video is long enough i hope you guys understand something and i'll share the pdf notes and the question and answers and everything as soon as i find them all right so this is basically it like i don't think there's much more to explain if there is like there's just one page left which i can uh, easily do in the online lecture so this is it for this video this is already too long so just pay attention to the entire thing i hope you guys watch the entire thing and if you haven't and i'm just talking for no reason then well have a good day <laughs>